All right, all right. It's a big day for the Let There Be Talkers, the Dell Razors, the Green Deans, all of my friends out there. It is episode number 600. And yes, that is a big deal. It is a big deal. It's been uh, 10 years. I think July 12th roughly would be maybe the 10-year anniversary. Whoa, that's today. <laughs> so fucking weird. I just looked down. And uh, noticed that. But 10 years, man, going strong every Monday, dropping an episode, hunting down guests, hoping I can find somebody that has inspired me in life to get on the other microphone and do something called a conversation, which a lot of people do not do these days in the texting world. It has been very, very gratifying to me to do this show it is definitely some uh some ups and downs and some frustrations of course you've heard that over the years of me going is anyone listening but i think at the end of the day the right people are listening and that's really all that matters like the article i read years ago if you have 1000 true fans you can do art the rest of your life and that's really all i want to do and doing this show is art to me because it, it, it feels good to sit down and talk to people that have inspired me in my life and share that with other people. A little positive energy, as my good uh, friend used to say, Brody Stevens, long live that man. And uh, here it is, 600 episodes, and I could not even think of a better guess than this man right here, Mr. Stone Gossard. And yeah, yeah, of course, Stone Gossard, Pearl Jam. We all know that. But what about this guy's body of work? His music has been driving my motivation since the day I heard Mother Love Bone. And that is the honest truth, man. I mean, of course, I get a little giddy that Stone is on because, to me, he has the ultimate career. He has done monumental stuff but can still walk down the street, which is damn cool if you think about it. I remember living right off of Hade Street, a couple blocks, 10th Avenue in San Francisco, and just rolling up to the Hate daily to get a burrito and uh walking past all the cool shops like rad leather and aardvarks and, and these different used clothing stores and bars that were open during the day and music just blazing out of all of these these businesses music was always on on hate street still is i'm sure and mother love bone Big, big record spun in San Francisco. San Francisco had music taste. I'll tell you that right now. And there was nothing better than that Apple record. For a solid couple of years, me and a few buddies just cranked the shit out of that record, man. Holy Roller, Bone China, Man of Golden Words, Crown of Thorns. This was something way different than that was going on in that era way different singer was mind-boggling andrew wood oh my god furry jacket big glasses elton john meets david lee roth meets stevie wonder he had the groove he had the vibe and the band was murdering it with groove rock one of the first true, real groove rock bands, them and Jane's Addiction, just laying down, just groove in that era, you know, because it was just, it was totally something different going on. And then, tragedy, they lose the singer. I'm like, ah, oh, God, of course, of course that's going to happen. You know, here's a band I love, they're gone. They come up from the ashes, find a singer down at San Diego. You guys know the story. It's, it's, it's pounded in our brains. The massive, massive record 10 drops and the whole game changes. I can still listen to 10 right now. 
and, and, and my mind will be blown. A lot of the deep tracks are where it's at with that black, deep release. Those songs, wow. And, and, and you know, Versus is one of the greatest records ever made. I can't even tell you how, 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 how many times I've spun Versus and still spin it. Rearview Mirror, Glorified G, Rats. Indifference. I mean, this record, the album cover, the sound, recorded it at the site, the whole thing, their whole career, Pearl Jam, home run, battle and ticket master, doing it right for the fans, long, cool concerts, different set lists, pure rock and roll, man. And then Temple of the Dog. Come on, man. What are you even talking about, Temple of the Dog? I, I say the word and I get goosebumps on my arm. I say the word Temple of the Dog and it's like, oh my God. I could go on and on and on about Stone and about the music he made. And I do sometimes when I trap someone in a corner at a party and they're like, oh yeah, man, who you into? And I'm like, what about this? And I just blah. I spit it all out on them and they just go, what the fuck? I just got trapped. I just got trapped by a, 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 a Seattle music lover. Damn right. Damn right. Everything that came out of there was great. I want to get into the uh, guests and uh, just a couple things before I do. I want to uh, tell you that the podcast and all of my podcasts, the Cactus Radio Network, uh, Dark Fonzie, At Home with Byron Katie, The Grail, and Let There Be Talk are back on Spotify. And it, I, I feel pretty strong about this, and, and it was great to talk to Stone about their battle with Ticketmaster. Look, I know I'm, I'm just a small, small little speck on the planet, but I do think that sometimes people need to know, look, this is what's going on. I don't get paid for streams and I don't get paid for ads that people put on the show uh, after it's out in the universe. So yeah, angry with Spotify, of course. Angry with Stitcher, of course. But, you know... I talked to some people that are, have massive podcasts and they're on Spotify and they were like, look, man, maybe one day you'll get the numbers and you can just call your own shots. But in the meantime, you got to kind of get on the train and uh, play the game. And I, I, and I know that, I know that, but I just, sometimes I like people to know, look, man, this is what goes down. When people say, yada. You ought to fucking buy that mansion in the hills and six cars. It's like, dude, I'm not getting paid for ads that they put on there. Now, if I do an ad, yeah, I'm getting some money. But if you hear an ad on Spotify or Stitcher or any of the, the streaming platforms and it's put on after the show's out there, I don't get any money for that. And nobody gets money for streams. Now, look, musicians get money for songs being streamed, but we don't get any money for podcast streams. So, look, I just wanted to say that I'm not an angry idiot out there. Uh, I'm not one of those people, but I do think that the people need to know that. That way they understand some platforms to support the artist. Uh, they could go after it and maybe do it, like my Patreon. So if you like what I do, I'm going to keep it up on Spotify. But join the Patreon and just throw a couple nuggets there and say, love what you do. And, and that's fine with me then. Then I'm like, all right, they can rob me, but I've got the true fans over here. And, and right on, man. It's, a, it's an even exchange. If I get some extra ears on this show, let's do it. And, that, and that's, uh, I'll say my piece and that's it. Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. Join up. There's 108 bonus episodes. I also do a Zoom fest every week where you can hang out with me and other fans. It's, it's fun, man. It's definitely fun, and it helps me out. So there it is. It's on Spotify. Fucking sound the cannons. 
Sound the cannons of uh, ACDC. <laughs> For those about to rock. <clears throat> okay. So, some shows coming up are going to be in Fort Worth, Texas this Friday night with Jay Buchanan. Cannot wait for that. We're going to be at 81 Club at Billy Bob's, one night only. I want to thank everybody that came out to Cleveland. I want to thank the Winchester. Holy shit, were those people cool. What a great club, great owners, great fans out there. I got an incredible um, Gertie painting, which is smoking cool. And uh, what else? Sacramento Punchline coming up July 29, 30, 31. And also, thank you for tuning in for that special episode I dropped on Friday with Jacob Dillon. What a great, great man, great friend, and great record. It went number one on the rock charts. Holy smokes. Number two on the regular charts. Can you believe it? Awesome, man. This deep in his career, got a number one record. Jacob Dillon, The Wallflowers, Exit Wound. Check it out. And I guess that is about it. Oh, I do want to say that Stone has a new single out with his uh, band with Matt Chamberlain. And I want to thank Matt Chamberlain for setting up this damn episode. Oh, my God, I owe you big time. Painted Shield. Check it out. Painted Shield, and also follow Loose Grooves Records on um, Instagram, Loose Grooves Records. Let me make sure I got that right, because I want you guys to follow it. Loose Grooves Records, mofos. Here it is. It is Loose Groove Records, and that's Stone's label. And uh, they got it fired up again, and they're going for it. Very cool. This episode is brought to you by CBD Lion, my sponsor for over a year and a half now. I know a lot of guitar players are going to be listening to this and a lot of musicians and a lot of artists. I know you got some anxiety. Maybe you got some joint ache. Maybe you have some problems sleeping. CBDLion.com. Use the code DEAN. I am telling you, I've been using this forever. Put it on your hands. Uh, they've got great topical lotions. I use it on my neck, my hands, sometimes my knees. This stuff works amazing. I use the tinctures for good sleeping and, and it really helps me just chills me. And also I have some for my dog, Gertie. I use the animal treats, CBD pet treats, which are 150 milligram CBD gives her a nice little chill helped her definitely during the uh, 4th of July fireworks cbdlion.com third party tested clean cbd no truck stop bullshit cbdlion.com i love you also i do want to uh, tell you guys i was out traveling this week and uh i use a lot of wi-fi all over the place which is dangerous you know airports airplanes coffee shops, everywhere I'm using these Wi-Fis, and that could be Hack City. And you don't want to be in that hacker zone, man. You get your computer hacked, you're just screwed. So what you're going to want to use, and I've been using this, is a VPN, which is a virtual private network. And I've got a great, great offer for you right now. And look, this is 30-day money-back guarantee, risk-free. You're going to get a huge discount. I'm using this. You want to surf the net safe. You want to go places and not let people know where you're at on the internet. You know, you can avoid advertisers and all that bullshit. There's nothing worse than when I'm looking at a pair of sneakers and then all of a sudden it's just three weeks of sneaker ads. So use a VPN and use none other than NordVPN. Yes, NordVPN.com slash Delray. Or just use the code Delray at NordVPN.com. Either way, you're going to get a bonus gift and a huge discount. And you can surf the net without you know, letting people know where you're going. Also, there's some places where uh, websites are blocked. Like if you're in China, you can't go on YouTube. But with a virtual private network from Nord, you can go anywhere, any website, do whatever you want. You're basically surfing around the... Uh, the world without people knowing on the internet. I, I'm telling you, you got to use this, man. It's great. Because if you get hacked, you're, it's a nightmare. 
nordvpn.com slash delray it helps you it helps the show and it, it, it helps out them keep them in business and they're doing a good thing i i believe in this stuff man a little privacy on the internet all right i've rambled enough let's get into it episode 600 thank you so much for everything people it is stone gosser how the hell are you dude pretty good oh, nice man. to meet you dude dream guest today i got goosebumps right now that's that's funny i like I mean, that I, i'm not like a, a cuckoo fan like yeah. oh my god but when i sit down and think about your songwriting and your your uh the music you've created and the live concerts that I've seen over the years, it's just uh, an honor to have you on, man. Well, that's that's very nice. Thank you so much. Oh, it's it's crazy to think about uh, the impact of your music, specifically you and the riffs and songs that you have wrote uh, over your lifetime that have impacted me and, and how much I've absolutely worshipped it, especially in the mother love bone era of when i first huh. yeah wow. man. i mean that yeah. shit was unreal to me yeah. dude that's that's so nice thank you i really appreciate it i love oh. that our uh i love that our mutual friend is matt chamberlain who is my i mean you know he's one of the greats of all times and if you're a guitar player and you're lucky enough to uh get to play with matt chamberlain um oh. it just I, you can do anything and it sounds, I mean, it's literally, you can play just two notes back and forth and he just makes a swing happen. You're like, oh, it doesn't even matter what notes I'm playing as long as I have that thing going on with me. Well, it's funny because if you really think about your career and you listen to your music, you are such a groove type of writer uh, from Love Bone to a lot of the Pearl Jam stuff to the Brad stuff to all of that. It's really focused on groove yeah i mean I, I i think about that a lot i'm uh i'm i'm uh, i'm uh, my my uniqueness has to do i think with a lot to do with my own ignorance about music and how i started approaching music from completely like i think it was from punk rock um and and the sort of the idea that you know anyone can kind of play something and and you just have your own little style and your own method and and there's a, and there's a way that that can turn out good and I think from the beginning, I was just a percussionist on guitar, really. I mean, I just, I found little patterns in, in, in percussive parts. And I knew that I didn't need to play a solo or do anything other than just three of these and two of these and then two of these and then three of these. And, and I just kind of bounce back and forth. And all of a sudden, everything else kind of starts to feel good. And I've, I've really honestly... <laughs> I should have gone to music school at some point because I, I probably, you know, I, I'm sure that my bandmates would appreciate it. But honestly, it's still exactly the same thing. I'm, you know, I'm in my apartment uh, above the garage and and just I'll just spend a few hours where I just pick up a guitar and I don't know what I'm playing. I just pick it up and I just get a little thing going and then I just kind of build it and so I'm just, it's, it's always been, been about arrangements and, and percussion for me, for sure. We're exactly the same age, born in 66. And were you growing up on a lot of the soul and R and B of the seventies? Like I was into at the same time I was living UFO and ACDC, I was listening to earth, wind and fire and lakeside and, and that type of stuff. Were you getting your groove knowledge from that? Yeah, I mean, some, and, and a, but a lot of FM radio. I mean, a lot of a lot of AM and FM radio at the time. But you know, I mean, uh, Gary Wright, Dreamweaver, like oh. the song changed my life. Like, I mean, I was like, okay, it's heavy, it's it's so groovy. You know, um, um, Brick House. Um, oh God, you know. And all that's, you know, th that disco stuff that it took me a little bit of time to process. But like, you know, why was it that, you know, that Saturday Night Fever soundtrack sounded so freaking good? Why did it sound so heavy? You know, it's like it was just always the the groove and that chord change, you know, that one chord change that 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 that's the blues. You know, it's just it is, you know, it's it's those it's that sustaining or that sort of tension that you create by hanging in a certain spot and then making a move and 
I, I still, it's still as simple as that for me, you know, is like, and then just, and always just being like, sort of, I'm not, I've never been a deep listener. I'm always just like picking up stuff from everywhere. So then it just gets filtered through me and I don't really know what it is. So it's sort of an amalgamation of just like, you know, kind of at all. So I, I, I'm not, I'm not really a student. I just sort of, uh, I just kind of get stuff. I'm like a garbage disposal. <laughs> I just get stuff and I, I just repurpose it. Your songwriting's incredible, man. It's just nuts to me. The, the library, the catalog is just crazy of, of all the music that you have wrote that there, there never really seems to have been a dry period for you. Were there times where you're just like, I don't have anything anymore because you just seem like a riff King. You know, I, 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 I knock on wood and I feel the same way, but I, I, I think if I sit down, even if I'm not inspired, if I just sit down with a guitar for an hour, I'll find something, you know, I'll find something. And usually it's, uh, you know, to describe it, it's, it's honestly, it's mostly about subtraction. <laughs> it's yeah. like, I'll sit down and I'll, I'll play something and I'll just go, what if you take that away? Well, what if you take that away? And then you end up getting down to these sort of really primal sort of, you know, uh, things that I, you know, I just think of it as kind of the fabric of the universe in a sense. It's like, you know, the, these rhythmic patterns or these sort of phrases or lyrics or, you know, rhythms that, it, like I said, it's like if you're playing with Matt Chamberlain, it, it kind of, it doesn't really matter whether you're playing an A chord or something really complex or whatever. If he's smiling at you and you're smiling at him and you've got a little thing going, if there's a singer there, the singer's going to sound good. If there's a, you know, if there's a, a not a great horn player there who just does a pop, pop, to the pop. Up, that's going to sound great. You know, it's like, it doesn't, it's not science, you know, it's not, th that's the part about it. I've never been a scientist when it comes to that kind of stuff. It's always been, you know, magic with a K in a sense. It's like, I, I'm, I don't question it. And I just, I just, I relish in it. You know, do you write on acoustic or electric? Both, both. Right. And it's, and it's, and it's, and, and the best time for me to write is like, uh, honestly, it, if I'm distracted a little bit, even, or if I only have 15 minutes sometimes where it's just, I realize that now that, you know, some, I used to have a lot of free time. <laughs> I used to really have a lot of free time, but I've got four kids. I'm married. And, you know, it's like, life is just busy. I mean, it's like, and there's, you know, there's lots to do that don't have anything to do with me, like enjoying my process. Oh uh, my God. But I, but what I learned is that I can still get there. And a lot of times, you know, even in the last, you know, we're working on, we're trying to write songs for a new PJ record right now. And I'm, I've just been really just the last three, you know, three weeks. I just kind of kept coming up with good little things that I'm really enjoying right now. So, but it's all kind of in that, you know, you have an hour and a half, you can go to the studio for one day and then you come back and then, you know, you, but it's all kind of rushing, but it's good because you're like, it doesn't matter as long as I kind of get the gist of it, I can, I can figure it out. And a lot of times you just getting the gist of it is, is kind of the most, you know, I, I think of it as like kind of rolling stones or something like that. Rolling stones where they're, they're sort of blase about what they did. And that's part of what made it so nasty sounding and so tough sounding. It's like, you know, the, the sort of uh, it's just uh, it, it'll all get stacked up with your friends, you know, it'll, right. in the end, it'll sound good. You just have to just have your, your, your spot, you know, figured out when you, when green green river is over and you start mother love bone which i think is one of the most mind-boggling bands that happened in the late 80s it's just you know we, we know what's out there the landscape was basically a lot of uh, motley crews and quiet rides and all that and then we had gnr and and jane's addiction who were like whoa what is that you know yeah thank really, god really radical but then here comes Love Bone. When you guys are first starting, are you influenced by the LA thing and and brewing that in? Because I know Andrew was pretty yeah. flamboyant and radical and cool. But was that I mean, was the songwriting rift around that? I mean, the first Motley Crue record was punk rock to me. It was totally. like in that it was in that Motorhead, like you know, Sex Pistols is heavy. It's you know, it's. You know, at the time, you know, the sort of the hair and the makeup was a little bit more sort of uh, gender bending a little bit more. It wasn't just like this, you know, it hadn't been totally it, it felt a little bit 
exciting in this kind of the Bowie sort of way that was just like, wow, it's like, you can be a freak, you know, it's like, so, um, yeah, we were absorbing that and the, you know, bands like the cult who were like, they, you know, they made that record with Rick Rubin, which was just like, holy crap. It's like, they were this kind of, they were this eighties kind of, you know, um, goth romantic. Band. Yeah. Goth band from and England. All of a sudden they, the and then they mixed this. Yeah. Then they, then they, then they did this kind of, you know, shift and it felt great. It's like, a, I want to shift, you know, I want to, I want to try, you know, I want to mix stuff together. I mean, that was the exciting thing about the eighties is like, all bets are off you know it's like it's gonna be dance or it could be you know glam or it could be funk or it could be heavy metal and so you know we we were absorbing that but it's you know it's it's this it's andy wood as an artist that kind of you know that gave that band that that spirit i mean i'm still in awe of his the gravity of his persona and and even to this day, you know, Regan Hagar, who was in malfunction with 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 Andy and who's my partner at Loose Groove uh, now, and we've been friends and working on art and influential. But I mean, to this day, we're still unpacking, you know, our relationship with Andy and, and his impact in terms of his artistry, his joy, just his joy and his uh, love of all different kinds of music, just, you know, absolutely Freddie Mercury, Prince, all these like way out flamboyant stars, but also into punk rock, also into, you know, I mean, all of it. And it was just uh, such an eye opening thing for me to experience people that loved all kinds of music. And I've never recovered, you know, uh, it's, I'm still in that feeling of like, how do you take a little from like, how do you just like listen to stuff and then just sort of anything goes, what, I, what's a bridge that sounds like it's from another era or, you know, or something that just happens that you're like, Oh, that's different. You know, well, why is it different? What do you, what's good about it? His vocals and lyrics were unreal. And, mm. uh, and it really gave that record so much depth, you know, like bone China, that kind mm. of stuff was just so, yeah. Like, wow, this guy looks kind of David Lee Rothy. Yeah. He's got furry jackets on. I saw yeah. you guys at the Cactus Club, yeah. you know, San, San, <laughs> San Jose. Wow. And, and I was like, this. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. And the Stone. You guys played the Stone when I booked uh, it, you know? Okay, yeah. I've actually booked you guys, booked you personally a yeah. couple times, which is Have so we wild. Met be- Have we met before? Yeah, when we were kids, but it was yeah. more like, um, you know, when you were on the Mookie Blaylock uh allison chains tour i booked okay, that yeah. at the omni uh, yeah great yeah like you guys were supposed to play this place the real rock and then they outbidded me and the whole reason i wanted you guys was i was like this is the old love bone guys yeah, gotta get okay. them okay and, and um and allison chains you know i got the yeah. the pre-cassette from concrete convention man in the box yeah, this is okay, gonna be yeah. great yeah. And they beat us. And then the day that they uh, you're supposed to play the real rock, they got shut down for a liquor license thing. And we got a call from the road oh, manager. Yeah. Said, Can you guys just put them on? And yeah. me and Jimmy Arsenal said, fuck it, let's do it. We called 50 of our friends and you guys came and played. It was Mookie Blaylock, Allison Chains, and the rest is history. You know? Okay, where where was that again, though? The Omni in Oakland. And, okay, it, wow. and it was uh, we at the time had three nightclubs, the Stone, the Omni and the One Step Beyond. But okay. You guys played the Omni okay. and it was we hung out all night after. And yeah, uh, of course, it was really interesting because you were called Mookie Blaylock at the time. And then when the band came out, it was Pearl Jam. And there was this uh, restaurant at the Phoenix Hotel called Mrs. Yeah. Pearl's Jam yeah. House. And yeah. I always thought they had to have got their name from yeah, there, yeah. you know? I mean, uh, you know, honestly, I think I remember us using a, a big list of words, but we had been up and down the coast. So we had seen that place. I know we had stayed there. So I'm sure it was it was all in the mix. Pearl Izumi was making these gloves, bike gloves. We all had these bike gloves that said Pearl on them. So, I mean, we went from Mookie Blaylock, great name, to yeah. Pearl Jam, which is like, yeah, it's, it's a pretty good name. It's like, I like the it's name. not... A, 
<laughs> now it's fine. You know, now yeah. it doesn't matter because it's like, yeah. but I remember at the time thinking, oh my God, Mookie Blaylock was the best. How come Mookie wouldn't just like em- embrace us? But he didn't. <laughs> it was so weird too, because like you guys were such basketball guys, you know, especially Jeff, you know, he's always, yeah. he's like, you know, at the time where it was like leather pants and everything, he's yeah. rocking like basketball uniforms. Yeah, yeah, I, know, I know. I love it. I love I it. Now, when you, go, when you go to do the Love Bone record at the plant in Sausalito, how quick do you guys track this record? I remember there was rumors of like Andy slipping out. And he was like hitting the hate and, and the mission looking for stuff, you know, but uh, and, and then all of a sudden, you know, he's gone. But were you guys just blasting this record out the whole time and he was gone and then came to the vocals? How did it happen? No, I mean, we were all there and it was, it was a little bit of a slog. You know, we, we used to make, we didn't really know how to make records back then. And I, I think we're still learning how to make records mm-hmm. in a sense, but it used to be the eighties the formula for, for rock records was like, you know, book a month and then you track the drums and everybody goes in and plays all their parts and you tune every time you change your strings and it's 80 layers of guitars. And it's all this, this, like, this is the kind of formula for it in a sense. So we all had kind of heard about it and we all thought, well, this record sounds cool. They must, you know, but we didn't have nearly as much fun as we should have. And we didn't, we should have had more songs and we should have written more songs when we were there. And we were just in this, like, we were just kind of slugging it out. So by the time we got to making that record, I think we made a, a good record, but it just, the, the joy was already sort of, you know, it was evaporating a little, little bit. So, um, but I, I remember Andy being there. I don't know whether Andy disappeared while we were down there too much. I don't remember having any, I don't have any memory of Andy, like, you know, going out and getting blasted and, and, and disappearing for a week or anything like that. He would do that. He he would do that when we got home and, you know, you, you might lose track of him for a few days or whatever. But at the time he was really trying to be sober and I'm not sure he wasn't even sober down there. And it was when he got home and lost his sobriety is when he died, you know, that's, which is the classic thing yeah. where you're like, you're not, you're not used to whatever it is. And you're so excited about, you know, doing it again. You just, you know, you do a little bit more than you, than you should. And then, you know, but it was a, it was a fun time. Cause like, my God, we're making a, we're making a, you know, a major label record and, 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 and it's sounding good, but it, I, I wish I had, time back with andy and and that time because we could have supported him so much more we could have written so much more we were all fighting with each other and trying to like i don't know it's just you get a bunch of guys in a room and they try to like be in control right, <laughs> everybody right. wants, well, the everybody, pressure too. everybody wants to be in charge you know and it's and it's sometimes it just sucks the life out of the thing you know and well, I'm, I'm as guilty of as anyone you know I'll tell you what, man, you, you released a masterpiece in my eyes, mm. you know, yeah. it's, it's the songs, the, the sounds. I mean, the plant yeah. is an iconic room. What made you guys pick the plant? It's so great. We just had an opportunity to, I don't, I can't remember how we ended up picking it, but, uh, our, and our guy was like, you should get out of, out of town and make a record. We we're like, Oh my God, get out of town and make a record. I've never, nobody's ever, you know, if you ever hear that, you know, somebody mentions that to you take, you know, you take your opportunities, you know, cause it's like, it's a once in a lifetime thing. But, and I think Whitney Houston had just been there recording. So we were like, wow, this is an actual studio, you know, and you go there and they say, do you guys want lunch? And you say things like, Oh, what? Yeah. Somebody's, somebody's yeah. Bringing <laughs> yeah. 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 You got, you got like runners, you know? Yeah. Like crazy. It's like all of a sudden, you know, um, it was, it was starting to get more real and it was, it was a fun, it was a fun time. We went, we had the earthquake. It was like, you know, oh, yeah. the, the, the walls were fucking warping. And so that's that right. During all, the 89 earthquake, the one during yeah, the world series, we were there. That was when we were recording the record. So, yeah. but I have, you know, the, really the, the era of mother love. And when we first started out, we wrote most of those songs in that, you know, that first year. And, uh, and that was the time where it was still like, it was, it was still wide open. We didn't know what it was. And, and then uh, when, when it started to be about getting signed and, you know, it just got serious, you know, in a way that I'm sure you've seen different people with different careers that, you know, they, you know, it's the joy is so much part of it and the, and the, the playfulness. And if you're not 
if you're not tuned into some of that stuff and kind of really feeling like a, a unit, you can, you can lose, you know, some mojo. Yeah, absolutely. Once Andrew's gone and you guys are trying to figure out what, what you're going to do next, of course, we know the infamous thing of Eddie gets the cassette tape records some of the uh, songs and sends them back, blows your mind. But, uh, you know, one of my favorite bands, ACDC, I got to recently talk to them about what it was like for a Brian Johnson audition. Who yeah, else were yeah. they looking at? Yeah. What were the sounds? Because at the time we've got a lot of high singers, you know, yeah, yeah. that yeah. kind of yeah. stuff. And, you know, here comes back a, a, a low vocal, which we hadn't heard. Maybe Axel, as far as his low register yeah. of like, uh, you know, it's my so Michelle. Easy. Yeah, it's yeah. so easy, that kind of stuff. But were you getting back tapes that were your classic 80s vocals? Who was coming in? What was going on with that? I mean, we only got a freaking four or five tapes. So, I mean, it wasn't, we never, you know, and I don't think anything, they were all like sort of, you know, bedroom tapes. I mean, none of them were sort of compelling. And so we didn't wait around. I mean, that's the thing. That's the other, you know, thing I think about a lot is like, if you're putting bands together and stuff, or you're trying to kind of do something with other people, it's like, you can spend so much time looking for the right, perfect people. And, and, but, but it's really, a, usually those people are in one connection away. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it, if you're waiting around for something too long, you're, you're not doing it right. You know? And, uh, I mean, that's, that's been the lesson in my life in terms of like, just, you know, it's just people that are around right now. There's someone right now that, you know, that, you know, or that knows somebody that you just have to jump off a cliff with. And, and I remember we heard Eddie's voice and it was, you know, like you said, it was like a completely different register than normal, you know, in terms of like, whoa, that's a, that's really interesting. And he obviously could sing. And, you know, Jack Irons just said, he's a, he's a great guy. He's a, he's a good guy. And he's, you know, he's loves sports and he's into, you know, you know, songwriting and he's, and he's, and he's motivated. And, um, and that's all it took. I mean, we were, we were jumping off cliffs right and left at that point. So, I mean, if you're lucky enough to like, suddenly your band is getting, you know, you've been in a band and it got signed, you know, that stuff can happen. So then you just think, okay, well, you know, maybe stuff can happen again, you know? Right. Right. I remember when I first saw you guys at the Omni, I was like, Oh, Whoa, well, th this isn't love bone at all. You know, yeah. you, guys, you didn't play any love bone. There was yeah. a, no sign yeah. of a love bone. And yeah, I yeah. was like, yeah. for a minute, it took me a minute. I was just yeah. kind of like, Boy. what, what is this? You yeah. know? Um, and then, you know, release me was like really the yeah, song yeah. that grabbed me. It's always the, the ballads from yeah. all the bands that you've been in that crush yeah. me. Yeah. And that was when I was like, oh, I get it. Yeah. You know? No, I was just going to say the ballads. I mean, they just tend to be a real a simple delivery system. You know, it's like there's less everybody doing something. And so there's more room for a singer to kind of like find his spot, you know. And I think, you know, we've certainly been too busy in our in our past but uh it's it's like songs like bone china and release that are the just it's kind of one riff or maybe one riff and a little change and then the singer can really just oh you know, but buttercup is the yeah. massive display yeah. of that yeah right you it's know simple. i think you actually have recorded one of the greatest records of the 90s which would be versus i think it's one of the greatest records to me that I've ever heard sonically and uh, coming off yeah. such a massive, massive debut, almost like an appetite type of thing where they're just like, Oh, what are we going to do? And you go up to the site, which I've been to, which is a great studio. Talk is cheap was done there. And oh. yeah, a masterpiece record. Yeah. And you go up there and you start to work on verses. Let's, let's dig into that a little bit. I mean, that's, that's, that's our first experience of making records with, with Brendan and, and Brendan came in with a completely new, you know, Brendan was hungry, an engineer who'd been, you know, working for Rick Rubin for, for years and, um, and really doing some really heavy lifting and finally on it, you know, and finally broke out on his own. It's like, Rick, you're great. I love you, but I'm going to, I know 
I know how to make records too. And, um, and we got kind of in the middle of that. He's a, he's a, he's a player. He understands music, but what he really did was he just did not let us, he just said, great. He said, go, you know, he was just like, it's just go. He recorded stuff and he got it sounding good and it was quick. And we didn't spend a lot of time on, you know, a lot of rehearsals or anything. He just kind of let us be us and he recorded it. And it, and I, you know, at the time I felt like I was kind of like, I was finding a path I thought in Pearl Jam that was even, that felt more natural to me than, than 10. I mean, I think 10 people love that record and, and there's a lot of good things about it, but you know, we were, we were getting better, you know, there's some good ones on that one for sure. Oh my God. <laughs> there's some good ones. It's, it's, uh, it's yeah. putting it lightly, man. That thing is insane. What, when you guys were up there, man, it had to just be insane pressure, right? I mean, it's like you're coming off 10 and you're the biggest band in the world all of a sudden. And it does kind of seem to change Eddie a little bit. If you look at the early interviews of him, he's very playful and almost kind of goofy and fun. And then by then he becomes a whole nother uh, yeah. animal. Yeah. And I, I don't think at the time we were recording that record, we thought about ourselves as being, I think we thought we had sold a lot of records, but I don't think it had registered in terms of the sort of bigness. But um, I remember having a, I, I remember that place is beautiful. And, and, and for me personally, you know, having gone through the green river and mother love bone and all of that to me, it was, I was probably feeling, you know, more confident and a little bit more relaxed and, and a little bit more like, okay, I, I've got it fi I, a little bit more figured out. I think for Ed, it was a completely different experience, you know, in terms of the psychology of, of him not being able to kind of walk around without people like coming up to him or whatever was a big, huge shift for him. But um, um, uh, again, I think the biggest factor is Brendan O'Brien in that, in that equation and, um, and Dave and Dave Aberziz, you know, playing great drums on that record, like, you know, and, uh, and me and him having a, a pretty good rapport in terms of just kind of getting some grooves going that were feeling pretty nasty and feeling, feeling good. So it was, uh, it was a, it was a good record for sure. Oh man. Stuff like rear view mirror. It's just like this steady punch on the gas, just going. It's like this, this saga that's just taking you for this ride, yeah. you know? And I, I remember going to the Slim Secret Show for the Surf Riders Foundation. And uh, there we were in Slim's and you guys were, you know, recording the record or maybe just finished. And you guys played uh, the Secret Show. And it was unreal to me. The band seemed like a completely, it was like Mach 5. You were just, on, you know, way better, way different. Yeah. Yeah. And, and man, it was, it was insane to see. And then later on in that year playing Spartan stadium at San Jose, San Jose uh, college, you know, here you are versus at a stadium, you know? Yeah. I don't remember it. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad you don't actually, you know, but it, to me, just to see the trajectory of this band and not blowing apart, you yeah. know, uh, definitely almost kind of a door scenario. You got this guy that can't go anywhere, almost Jerry Garcia, Jim Morrison thing where they can't go yeah. anywhere. And then the other guys are dealing with it also, which is yeah. uh, so much craziness, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's a bizarre, uh, blessing. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Let's talk about the drummer, the different drummers over the years. Of course, Jack was there, Dave. And, uh, you know, Matt and, and, and both Matt's and everything. It is interesting. I played with a lot of great drummers and it is wild how, how much of a drummer can change a band, right? Like yeah. a Jack Irons, let's say yeah. totally different feel for Pearl yeah. Jam. Yeah. And it, I mean, it, and it, for some people, it probably took them someplace they didn't want to go or, you know, in retrospect, it's a blessing that we had that opportunity because we just it kind of opened the door to some different type of songwriting and, and and it and it helped us understand kind of where you can go. And and Jack was a total blessing. I mean, the, the time that we recorded with him because he's just such a team player, he's so thoughtful and um he really can he really can play great drums. You know, I think at the time he was going through a lot of personal stuff and a lot of, you know, having some physical, you know 
physical struggles as well that were, you know, Pearl Jam being a drummer for Pearl Jam is such a brutal, I mean, yeah. you know, it's like a three hour marathon and um, it's all, all kind of on your shoulders. Cause you know, the guitar players can play as fast. We just go da 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 da, And it's like, we act like we're, you know, we're heavy lifting, but it's not, it's not the same as um, what having to do your, you know, the kick drum and your hi hat and the cymbals and the snare drum, you know? So uh, it's a, it's a tough gig. So, but, Jack was one of the records we made with Jack. I'm still, you know, I, I really appreciate. And again, still really making homemade kind of records. They're just like, you got a song. Okay. Let's work it up. Well, that's, that's good enough. You know, we'll, <laughs> let's, put it let's, let's put it out. The band would kind of, you know, do that, but then Eddie would polish his thing for a while, which is great. Cause he, it, he would get it right emotionally and lyrically. And then the rest of us can kind of sound like, you know, they're pretty good. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so much weight on him, right? Yeah. It's like, hey, make this so it's not just a rock song. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's pressure like crazy. But we wrote some of our best songs that way. So that's the lesson. That's the crazy lesson is like, you know, you can bring in a riff and, you know, Last Exit and uh, Tremor Christ. I mean, we just, there were just two parts. We just, I just brought them in and, and, the next thing you know the next day there was a song so it's not you know if you have if you have somebody that's tuned into the poetry and tuned into the artistry of human expression and voice and language um it, you know it's it's your job as a as a songwriter or a rhythm guitar player is is pretty it can be pretty simple you know find a change find find a little you know find a pattern or find a little groove and then shift it, you know, find yeah. a spot to shift, do something, you know, just, it's just one move, you know? Well, I, I definitely call you the secret weapon of uh, any band you're in. It's just crazy. Like it's, it's unreal. Like all of your catalog, like I've said over and over, I mean, when I got Brad, you know, I met Sean somewhere and uh, we loved Prince. We talked for hours. Yeah. And we did some gigs together, uh, Satchel and my band Oh yeah. Nice. Yeah. And yeah, I remember he gave me this little satchel with rocks and stuff. And he's like, yeah, oh. you're a special dude, man. And yeah. we, we stayed in touch over the years. But when I first heard that record, I was kind of like, I can't even believe how good this record is for like a Sunday night vibe. You yeah. put it on 20th century buttercup. This stuff was just insane. And here you are with another crazy great singer with mad talent. It's like three yeah. in a row. I'm like, this guy yeah. is growing him up there. Yeah. Yeah. What, what was it like when, uh, where did you first meet him and, uh, and decide to start working with him? Uh, it's all, you know, Regan Hagar and him working at, uh, at tower records together. And, uh, you know, Regan is, he's my, you know, spirit animal i mean or i'm his spirit animal i'm not sure which way it goes but i mean honestly he he really uh loves art in a way that i can only emulate and um and and he loved you know he was the one that was connecting with andy and they were doing the punk rock and the kiss and all of that way before i even was you know picking up anything you know so it, it really you know he he taught me a lot, but he, you know him and Regan working together at Tower Records, and and you know Regan's always you know starting new things, and just unlikely kid from Bakersfield's working up there, and he gave me a you know he, they talking about music, and then he gave me a tape, and he's he's into he's into soul music, and uh, but he wants to you know, and so that's exactly the kind of thing that would cue us you know towards like okay there's something different like what what can we do that mixes that at this and your thing and you know and again it's being in a band finding your guys or your girls or your team and just kind of like going it's us against the world and um what kind of magic can we hatch together and i remember you know i remember coming back from making i think i feel like i came back from making verses and i think that's the time where you know, I had seen Regan and we had kind of gone all through the mother love bone and Andy's death and all of it. And he had been playing a little bit with Sean and in, in satchel. And, um, and I just, at the time I was, I was really tuned into sort of, I guess my, my confidence about art in the sense that don't wait and just schedule something and just do it. And you got to start with something. And I just, I said, 
you know, we, I think we were jamming a couple of times and we had written a song or two and, and, um, and I just said, we should make a record. We'll just, you know, and we, and we didn't have a bass player. And my friend, Alex Rosen asked, who's a who, the guy that ran rock candy. And was, I used to go out and drink a lot of beer with him. And he's a, guy, a local, a friend of mine. And, and I'd asked him, I said, you know, any bass players? And he said, my friend, Jeremy Toback's bass player, he's in Los Angeles. I said, well, great. We'll just have him come up and we're going to make a record. You know, we never heard him play or anything. And we just, it was that sort of like, wow, that's just totally winging it. So we rehearsed for a week and we went in the studio and we had, you know, smoked a lot of pot, just kind of like, you know, you, you got to be good at, at, at identifying what you want to do, you know. When something good happens, you got to be able to quickly kind of go, okay, tape it, get that, and then set it. As, you know, you you got to do- be able to document at least rudimentary, like otherwise it's just a jam session and you don't want just a jam set. You got to get like the bits and pieces so you have something in the studio to kind of like to build on. But all of us were in that sort of writing in a group sort of mode. And, and for whatever reason, I was able to kind of do this sort of uh, shadow world of Pearl Jam. It's like <laughs> Pearl Jam is this. And then what if I was on the other side of it? Like, what if I was, I don't know what, what, where it came from, but just, you know, again, subtraction or just, you know, um, just uh, swinging things in a way that is different than I would have done it in Pearl Jam. So it, it had that thing, but it feels like I, such I, an, it feels like such an authentic, uh, soul rock record to me. It doesn't feel like, oh, here's some guys trying to do soul rock. Yeah. It just yeah. feels super organic yeah. and yeah. real as, as hell. You know, yeah. it's like, this is incredible. This record. Yeah. Well, l- turns out Jeremy Toback's a freaking great bass player. So we lucked out there um, and he, and he really could uh, make it bounce a little bit in a way that was just like, great. You know, it's, it's funny, but uh, you know, and Brad has made good records since then. And we're still <laughs> digesting kind of what, it, what it was, but, you know, that, that first one is special because of the way we shared and the way we didn't have a plan and, uh, and everything else started to kind of like, Oh, I'm going to bring in some songs or he's got some songs or he's kind of writing more extravagantly now. And like, and so we, we kind of lost that sort of, uh, sandbox, some of that sandbox play playfulness where it's like, you got three things, you got a bucket and a shovel and a stick and that's all, that's all you get. You know, it's like, and sometimes if you only have three things, that's, you know, that, that can really be the, you know, it, it can break it down to its most rudimentary, particularly for singers, you know, particularly when there's, when you, when you only have a few moving parts or there's, or stuff's kept simple, you know, I was always wondering once the Pearl Jam explodes, now you're like a full blown touring musician. A lot of times that people don't realize you're like, holy shit, man, my hands hurt. My back's hurting. My ears are fried. Once you're out onto the, you know, onto the run and there's no slowing down, were you getting pretty fried out there? I I probably was, you know, I think, I mean, I, I'm sure I was getting fried, but I've always been so kind of driven in a sense. I think I was, uh, I think I just wasn't tuned into what I was feeling and I was just going, you know? Um, so I don't remember ever coming home and I, I don't remember, <laughs> I, it, you know, the Bon Jovi on the plane, the sort of, yeah, they're, yeah, they're yeah. all, they're all, they're all worn out. You yeah. Know, yeah. That, or wherever yeah. I may roam Metallica. Yeah. 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 It's like, yeah, oh. right. yeah, yeah. It's, it's a romantic <laughs> thing. Uh, you know, there's times where you're exhausted, but it's like, if you, you have a good night's sleep and you don't stay up all that night drinking, then yeah. you, you, you should be fine, you know? So, but yeah, no, I'm, I, I, it, it wasn't, it wasn't too much. It wasn't like working fucking 10 hours a day on a construction site, you know, right. <laughs> not even, I, not I, even, I, not even close. You right. know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. What about that? Um, uh, that, um, uh, sunburst Les Paul, let's get a little story on that. That seemed to be your main ride for years. Right. Yeah. I think I broke that down in Australia. Oh shit. Yeah. Oh, I was having a, I was having a consistently bad uh <laughs> i was i got a i finally got a wireless so i wouldn't get tangled up in my cords which i'm now not using anymore but um and uh my wireless pack was had gone out for like the third show in a row and i think i just i finally smashed the guitar mike mccready smashed the guitars all the time he was like man he'll yeah. smash up he'll smash a guitar i never smashed them it's kind of like i don't have any tattoos either but 
I, I did, I did smash one. Um, and that was, that was one that went. So it's a little, I would like to have that one back, but Damn. All right. what was that? Like a seventies Les Paul? Something like that. I don't think it was, it, yeah. I think, yeah, I think it was it like, looked 70s like 70s Les Paul. to me. Yeah. 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 It was, it was decent. It wasn't. Yeah. I'm not a, I'm not a crazy guitar, you know, freak as far as I have some good ones, but some of them are just these less, you know, these Gibson reissues that are just great. I mean, it's yeah. like, they play great. So, McCready's and then I can, got some insane uh, ones. Oh my, the Mike McCready model reissue is oh, like my, one of my oh, favorite guitars. Oh, I want that strat so bad. Oh the, yeah. The 60 strat. Oh, yeah. bring that on, man. I love, <laughs> I love McCready because I think he's like one, you know, the two of you guys are just so underrated. It makes me angry sometimes. I mean, it's oh, kind of, it's no, kinda, no, 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 it's better. <laughs> it is better. It is better. Cause you can walk down the street. I get it. But, you know, well, or just, I mean, you know, Mike McCready is a good player. I'm a, I'm a decent player, but you know, there's so many good guitar players out there. It's crazy. I mean, if you look at YouTube, you can see freaking eight year old kids playing the shit out of freaking Beethoven and stuff like that. It's like, that's not what we do. It's yeah, like, I get look, that. I'm we talking, just kind of. <laughs> I'm talking about a two guitar team, man. A Malcolm A. Yeah, yeah. A McCready Gossard. You know, yeah, right. I'm talking I'll about dudes that play off each other, and you just don't. You're so good that you don't even notice it. That is yeah. when you are great. You're like, yeah. oh my god, these guys are killer. I mean, I mm. remember when I saw Temple of the Dog at the Rip party. Okay. Yeah. Remember right. that. Yeah, it was like the second time you guys ever did it. It was like, we're yeah. going to do Temple of the Dog. Yeah. And I watched McCready play that solo on Reach Down. Reach down. Yeah. And I was like, well, dude, I, you can't see right now, but I just yeah. got goosebumps again. Yeah. I was there two feet away. And yeah. I was like, I can't even believe how good this yeah. guy is. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And those last Temple shows. Yeah. Those are some of the greatest shows I've ever seen in my life. The Achilles Last Stand, which is my favorite Zeppelin song of all yeah. time, yeah, it's like is it's got to be one of the hardest songs ever yeah. to play. Yeah, and you guys destroyed that. Yeah. What what was the decision on that? Was that Chris? Like, let's do this. I don't think it was Chris. I think it might have been. I think it might have been me. I really? think that. We, well, I mean, he was so open to anything. I mean. That was such a fun tour and, and it is such a joy. I mean, to practice for that and to try to get good for it. And like, you know, I mean, it was, it was such a, we were all so excited because of one him and his like crazy talent and, and us making that record with him and, and it being such a good record and us again, rehearse for fucking one week and going and make one of the great records of our entire career you know why well because you have an incredible singer songwriter in chris cornell who knows how to do it and he knows how to let you be kind of you and you have matt cameron who's fucking needs needs one drum take to like and him playing it and so both of those guys at the peak height you know the peak of their powers and inviting us to be kind of part of the process and we brought something that was that was special to those guys you know because soundgarden was pretty they were pretty rigid and and we just we had a we have a little bit of smear that we brought in that was just like a little of that stonesiness or that sort of you know um a, sort of a little bit more bluesiness that that ended up being such a nice touch to that you know oh. Oh. to that record so man it's I Still mean, one of the highlights of my life for sure. That that thing's a masterpiece. I mean, reach down. Uh, you know, is that was that done in like one take or a couple takes? I mean, because it's got such a feel, and then when it drops down and it's just the the vocal there and huh. everything, it's just beautiful, man. And and you know, wooden Jesus with the crazy beats. The whole huh. thing is like, how, wait a minute, these are like. This is, you know, whenever you hear all-star band, it makes me cringe. It's going to be yeah, horrible. Yeah. Nobody yeah. has chemistry. There's no songwriting. Yeah. And then this thing is 100% crushing yeah. all the way through. I mean, it's, I, it's, you know, in my mind or what I generally say is it's, you know, it's all about, you know, Chris's generosity. It's like he thought he, he wrote a song about his friend who died. And then he invited his friend's band who was in, you know, who was in a band with him to play on the record. 
I think when you start with that kind of generosity, everybody is present. You know, everybody is like understands that it's not about being in an all-star band. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, wow, this is this is something special. This is bigger than, you know, this is like what they did in the 60s, you know, when they when people were sharing music with each other or kind of, you know, uh, it's or you know, so I really do think that it's the motivation of of where the songs came from and and then sharing it with other people that you know that loved Andy. It just you got a spirit there that's just gonna help it along, you know. So God, I mean it, to see it early on too at the rip party was like really mind boggling, you yeah. know, because it's so like that's like brand new back then, you know. But then to see it at the forum with massive lights and sound and well rehearsed with a, a long set list and everything. It was yeah. like, this is insane. And is that where you saw you saw the forum show? Yeah, yeah. Do we two there? Two yeah, the forum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got an incredible photo from it. My yeah. buddy Steve Rose took. It is awesome because the stage looked like you were out on an old pier, like on the waterfront movie. Yeah. Yeah. That, that stage it wasn't any, we hardly had anything up there, right? It was just sort of bare. That's what was cool about it. It yeah, looked yeah. like you were on a like a a, a pier, a fishing yeah. pier, like on Jaws yeah. when the guy throws yeah. the, the woman's uh you know prime rib out. <laughs> God damn, that shit was good, dude. Now can I wanted to talk to you? I'm gonna call you whenever I have any sort of <laughs> yeah. depression or I'm feeling yeah. kind of low. Do you mind yeah. if I just call you? Because oh. you know, you're really I mean, <laughs> oh man, please do because you know what? I don't think you understand how much look like i said i'm not one of those fucking lunatic fans i understand the depth of the art that you have put out into the world and when matt said that he might be able to get you on i was losing my mind because i was i was thinking about it especially last night i was laying in bed like okay i mean i got a million things here they're just all jotted down but i was there so as i talked to you it fires up these great memories for me, you know, just yeah. like, oh my God, this show yeah. and that show and these guys and those songs. And it's, it's, it means the world to me, man. The, yeah. the music well, you put out there, you know? And also I played in the band the whole time. So I'm like, fuck yeah. these guys, how do yeah. they have all these great <laughs> songs? <laughs> I wanted to ask you a little bit about that Seattle scene. Of course, I played there a lot in my day and it was out of control for a while and everything. And uh, you never left, right? No, I'm no, I'm still in Seattle. I love that. I love that no. about you, you know, but let's let's talk about that singles and all that. And the Matt Cameron and Matt Dillon being one of the high water marks for me of yeah. uh, acting. I think Matt Dillon's one of yeah. the greatest. Been trying to get him on 10 years. He just, oh, yeah. I get the Heisman. You know what I mean? He knows who <laughs> I am. But I mean, let's talk about Matt Dillon. He, he's the fucking, he's the Stone Gossard of movies, man. Yeah. Just crushing art. Yeah. Drugstore yeah. cowboy, masterpiece, yeah. outsiders, Tex, yeah. Flamingo yeah. Kid, you know? Yeah. Um, something about Mary. Something about Mary. Yeah. How about Over the Edge? One that probably turned you on to Cheap Trick like me. It's, oh, uh, and then he wasn't in River's Edge, though. No, that was no. That Over no. the Edge uh -huh. was that one with the Teen Rebellion. And uh, I, don't think know, I saw it. Oh, dude, it's uh, Matt's first film. You got to see okay. it. It's okay. Cheap Trick is the soundtrack. OK, yeah. Oh, you got to see that. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> what was uh, that know, like working with him? You know, he's he's funny. He's 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 kind of a goofball in a way. And like he's like making jokes and having a good time and um he, he it was it was fun and then just see him in the wig every day and just like you know and wearing the shorts i mean we it, it was <laughs> the like, costume yeah like the long johns and like, yeah the grunge uh, costume yeah right exactly it's funny uh, though because that's was, how we dress dude yeah. i lived on yeah i lived at hate street that's how i dress yeah. great i got them right now green docks some you know shorts with uh long johns just in case yeah. it was foggy out and a flannel that I got at, you know, Aardvarks or whatever. Yeah. It's just, that was the gear. You didn't have a car, so you rode your bike. So you want your pants to get caught in your thing? No. So you got a long johns and shorts. Like yeah. that's, yeah. that was the logic for me, at least. It was like, it's, it just keeps your, uh, from catching your jeans. 
I love the look too. I love the yeah. look, you know? We we don't need to go back, but we can if we want. <laughs> I wear green docks. <laughs> I wore them last night. Oh, nice. I don't give a fuck, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not like some tumbleweed out there. Like I'm still grunge, but I'll, I'll mix up a look, man. I'll mix up a look. You know what I mean? I was doing comedy a couple of nights ago. I'm a comedian now and I was wearing green docks and I realized, ah, oh, this is taking this guy in the front row out. Cause he's like, Oh sweet. He's hitting his lady like sweet shoes, you know? And I'm like, damn, he didn't hear that joke at all. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. It's so funny, man. But singles, what what a class. I mean, look at all that shit you've got to do, man. That's all Cameron Crowe, man. That's that whole, that was like Hollywood coming to Seattle. I was like, we were just witnessing like what multiple producers and, you know, a lot of craft services and a lot of just like the whole, you know, ha- ha- dailies, people looking at dailies and all, you know, and then, you know, everybody getting shit faced every night <laughs> yeah oh that's great <laughs> uh i mean it was the right it was the right time to make a movie like that and it was it, it, things lined up for cameron in that sense you know the music was there's some great songs on there man oh, great wood, songs wood wood and then yeah the, the cornell song man yeah. come on yeah no oh, yeah that's stupid good yeah uh, you know he was he was hitting on all cylinders, you know, when he was writing that solo stuff, you know, again, Chris Cornell, like, you know, he knows that Cameron's making a movie and, um, and, and Cameron sent him a script and the script talks about, you know, the the band name. And I I can't remember what the band name is now. It's like, uh, Oh yeah. What was it? It was like a, uh, damn, I I can see it. I can see the logo, you know, but, 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 and, and Jeff made the, the, fake cassette that had the yeah. song titles and then chris wrote songs to all those song titles it's like that's uh that's not something you do if you're like a, a serious artist and you're like trying to make it you know it's like that's something you do when you're being playful and you really love art and you're like this is going to crack up these guys and you know maybe it'll fit in in some way i'm sure he had some ambition around it as well but it's it's really just showing how fucking kick ass I am. It's like I don't even just give me some song titles. I'll get, yeah. <laughs> you, go, you write you write the song titles. I'll write the songs. You know what yeah. I mean? Like yeah, and they'll be like legendary. That's yeah. that's that's Chris Cornell. You know, I love that's that. crazy. Like sometimes I do a comedy show where they you take suggestions from the crowd, and it's some yeah. of my favorites. So you just go and you know somebody will say like crabs and. And then you try to riff yeah, on, on yeah. the thing and your brain will go somewhere that's totally wouldn't go usually, you yeah. know, which is really cool. Yeah. And it's, it's, it can be terrifying. You know, you're doing it in front of a, a live audience, which is, you know, I mean, comedy is, that's the, I mean, that's the front lines of <laughs> that, that's serious frontline work in terms of, of putting yourself out there and knowing that your honesty and your you know your that your honesty is your biggest weapon you know what i mean or or that you're you know that as an artist like if you can tell the truth or some part of the truth that you're going to get a reaction you know and i just i really admire that about comedians and i think about comedians all the time as being like the most like the it's the greatest you can have the most impact in terms of changing the world because comedians are the first line of like if somebody can say it a comedian can kind of say it you know they can start to kind of talk about stuff that you can't yeah. talk about that can be 10 years later everyone's talking about it but you know the the canary in the coal mine is the comedian yeah. that can kind of just figure out how to articulate something that's on everyone's mind that you can't talk about yet so it's i'm impressed with people that can get up there and do that that's just an incredible skill do you do you watch any comedy like on Netflix or go see it live? You know, it's been a while. I, you know, I, I have to say having four kids, I'm just not, I haven't, I don't watch. I mean, I haven't seen the, the amount of TV shows that people have recommended to me that I've not been able to watch yet. You know, it's like, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's crazy. So, but I've seen plenty of comedy. I've definitely been affected by comedy. You know, it's like, you know, going to see Chris Rock, you know, um, you know, going to see, uh, um god you know eddie izzard fucking freaked me out you know uh you know that kind of stuff but starting out steve martin records and you know starting out with 
Richard Pryor and um, Bill Eddie Hicks. Murphy, of course, Bill Hicks. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I haven't been keeping up. So and I, I need to. And uh, it's funny. I just watched it. I was just checking a little of yours out and cracking it up. And you were it was a post COVID uh, YouTube thing. You're you're really uh, you're doing great. But yeah, I think it would probably maybe one of your first things. I think you had gotten up on some back of the pickup truck or something. Yeah. And you're just like, oh, shit. yeah, <laughs> oh, man. yeah, it was great. <laughs> yeah, that's that's like one of the first shows I did. It was in the back of a truck in um, in Eagle Rock, you know, which yeah. is a cool hipster neighborhood that I love. Yeah. And the crowd was there and the, and they were ready. They were ready yeah, to, oh, to laugh. And, you know, I was talking about uh, people eating in Denny's parking lots, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and telling people to freaking leave the groceries in the front, you know, 20 yeah, yards yeah. from the front porch. <laughs> yeah. Postmates, leave it on the lawn. <laughs> which we're all still recovering from. Honestly, it's like our, our level of social uh interaction is so st- stilted at this point i wanted to talk to you about that because uh it was horrific what has happened of course a lot of lives uh have been lost and it was it, it's the most insane thing i've ever seen in my lifetime in your lifetime also because you're the same age but also another thing that was uh that killed was some great records and the strokes record and your guys's record, I think are two of the best records I've heard in mm. a good 10 years. Mm. I was really, really blown away by your new record. And especially the single, uh, the clairvoyant one, you know, it, yeah. it, that, that talking heads feel to it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was so fired up that yeah. Pearl jam sounded like that. I mean, yeah. beyond when it came on, I heard it on like Sirius XM or something. It was like, Hey, new Pearl jam. And it came on and I was like, I immediately, I remember I called my buddy and I go, Oh man, you, you got to hear the new Pearl jam. It is smoking. And man, it just, it just disappeared, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's fine. I mean, you know, people have said, you know, have talked to me about it. It's like, oh, is it, are you disappointed that, you know, the record, you know, didn't do as well as you wanted it to, or you put all that work into it? It's like, we've been so, we've had so much success. And it, 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 those songs are there. They're never going anywhere. And they're going to have a chance to have a life in our live sets. And we're going to be excited to play them. And we're planning new records. And there's no, there's no, I don't think anyone is like, oh my God, I'm so disappointed. You know, I, I think everybody's like, it's just the way life goes. I hear and you. I hear you. The I'm most just... unexpected, crazy, unexpected thing, you know, literally anything goes at this point, uh, given that we just went through a pandemic and that they came up with a freaking vaccine in 16 months, which is crazy. I, yeah. I mean, it's just like, oh, there's five of them. Oh, and it actually works. And, you know, so there's one for science right there. That's you know, cheers. That's great. Absolutely. But then, but then, but then like just two days ago there, you know, uh, Harry reads on the, on the radio saying, Oh yeah, by the way, yeah, we're actually, it's official. There is UFOs and you know, yeah. and it's, yeah. and then that's now old news. And then, yeah. you know, somehow it's like, that's been announced. The government is now officially announced that there's UFOs and we've seen the footage now. And so, and no one goes. cares. I'm doing yeah. a bit about it right now. <laughs> it's like, this would make the conspiracy theorists people shut the fuck up. They've been ruining parties for years. They trap you in the corner. They get a bump of cocaine and they're like, dude, you don't understand the government. They shot Kennedy and they, they got UFOs and they're hiding and all. And it's like, well, yeah, they just told us all that and no one cared. So just go away. You know what I mean? No, you're ruining parties for years or concerts. You know, like, yeah, you know, actually, uh, you know, uh, 5G created COVID. T-Mobile's to blame. It's like no yeah. one, no one cares. <laughs> no one cares. It's crazy, right, Stone? It's like, dude, they said there's UFOs on yeah. 60 minutes. The next day, not one fucking thing. I was yeah. at Trader Joe's and people were cutting in line. They didn't yeah. even. There was no yeah. fear or nothing. Yeah. So it's not. It's not really changing us, and it, we're gonna. You know, and. Honestly, I think if the UFOs have really been around for kind of 40, 50 years yeah. and they haven't destroyed us yet, I think they're pretty, pretty great so far. I mean, they, they would, they're doing way better than we would have ever done had we yeah. discovered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they, pro- they probably pay for music too. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> 
Let, before we get out of here, uh, first of all, man, I, I would love to meet you one day face to face. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and Come look see at the show anytime. Yeah. Oh, God. And uh, I've been in Seattle a lot, the Paramount and the more man, the Seattle has some of the greatest venues in America, the more and and the Paramount and even the clubs that were happening back in the day, the Crockett or the alligator or whatever it was, the crocodile. Yep. And uh, that other one downtown that I forget the name, every fucking episode I talk about Seattle. Uh, uh, Showbox, probably? Showbox, there it is. Yeah. 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 I just had uh, Jeff Tate on from Queensryche. And, oh, yeah. Uh, nice. Yeah. Changed yeah. my life. Whoa, I mean, right? Fucking Queen of the Reich. It was like oh. when it came out, I was like, okay, that's fucking. Oh, my God. That vocal, dude. That's officially heavy metal right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seattle had something going on right oh, then. Oh, my God. Yeah. But let's talk before we get out of here. I didn't get to go to those shows, but what about that weekend where you guys played every song? Do I got this that, right? Phil you, Phil Philadelphia. We played yeah. four shows. And, yeah. You played every song. Yeah. All and, and we nearly played every song almost all the way through. God, that's so fucking <laughs> I mean, cool. I mean, we, we probably... A quarter of those songs we rehearsed once, so I mean, it was like you know, we yeah. were we were we were working our way through. But luckily, we're so kind of you know half-assed generally when we make records that people are used to it sounding so. Wow. <laughs> you keep saying that shit, but you guys sound great live every time I see you, man. Okay, good. I want to keep that going. I'm not going to change anything, man. How do you look back now on the, uh, and this is a hacky question, but I always have um, my own battles with the business and, uh, and everything. And, you know, I always say Lars is right. And, but how do you look back at the Ticketmaster battle now? Um, I feel pretty good about it. You know, we work with Ticketmaster still, but Ticketmaster now uh, advertises what their fee they're charging is, and you can negotiate with them what that fee is. So, you know, at the time the fight was Ticketmaster, you know, we were selling tickets for 50 bucks and the market rate was, I don't know, a thousand. So yeah. Ticketmaster was just saying, we're going to charge a $20 service charge for this or a $30. You know, they were just making up whatever number they wanted to go and they just would add it on to your ticket because you weren't charging enough. And the logic was, well, they should, the band should charge the market rate. Like, like somehow we're not, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so we fought against that, and and you know, it was a it was a debacle. I mean, it was all convoluted, and and you know, it 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 wasn't it wasn't. Um, if we could do it again, I'm sure we would do it differently. But I mean, we we feel pretty good about the fact that yeah, someone's going to charge you a service charge for sure if they're managing your ticketing for you. There's no question yeah. about that. That's that was never the argument. It was just is this that do you get to decide with that. You know, is is there any logic to being able to say, hey, our tickets, we want them to be this price. So we'll we gotta figure out what that is together. We can't just let you do that on your own. So yeah. so I, I feel pretty good about it, but you know, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that every week or people yeah. will get tired of you. <laughs> well, I, I love that you did do that. I love I love some pushback and I do love questions um from artists. I mean, coming down to yeah. right now, what's going on in 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 London with uh McCartney and all these people jumping on on the streaming uh, royalty rates. So, I mean, if people don't say anything, we're just going to have the Colonel Parkers forever. Yeah. You know? And, yeah. And I mean, it, it, if the opportunity is out there to make an impact in terms of getting more, you know, uh, to getting some companies to pay better royalty rates, I mean, I'm, I'm totally down for that, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, one of the labels, I think it was Sony, just recently said they're going to get rid of the, uh, the uh you know the debt on a lot of records uh the yeah. recoup stuff and uh holy shit did i see that i was like this is beautiful yeah you it's know? right up there with ufos I that's mean, right like, <laughs> unbelievable <laughs> that is a ufo this, this, and that was another yeah. thing no one talked about i was like hey assholes do you see what this guy just did <laughs> <You know? laughs> i love it man uh you know i love people that do push back and um and i respected the battle and I know it, it was uh, really gnarly and brutal and probably took a lot of the artistry out for a little while, wrapping your head around that. But uh, I love that you guys did it. And I got to tell you, man, I cannot thank you enough for doing this. This is episode 600 for me. I've been doing this. 10 oh, years. wow, man. Yeah. Awesome. I want to have Great. somebody on special 
and 500 at Paul Stanley and John Mayer. So here we oh, are. Yeah. Uh, Great. We got you. And uh, if you can get Mike on, have him hit me up. I would. Oh, Mike, Michael, do it. Michael, do it in a second. Oh, please just get, get, get email me and get him in the loop and let's get him on. Yeah, and no uh, I'll, re I'll release him number 601. It would be okay, crazy great. cool. Yeah, I love it. No, is this, this is not live. This is uh, no. you're recording this and then you'll, when will, when will it be out? It'll be out in four weeks. Okay. So um, do you have some stuff kind of to announce? Uh, yeah, I, maybe uh, I might end up um, just, you know, reconnecting it back to some loose groove stuff that's going to happen in, uh, around that time too. So let's do that now. Let let's uh, talk about loose grooves because you got painted shield. And you, you've had this label for years. Let's get into that. Well, you know, just briefly, we just, we were, we were, we were, Regan and I had the label uh, 90 up through 98, I think 96, 98. And then we, and then we stopped doing it and we just recently started doing it again and we're having a blast. So um, Painted Shield is a band that I'm playing in right now with this guy, Mason Jennings and Matt Chamberlain, one of the greatest drummers of all times. And it's great. Also this, yeah, I listened also to the this first record. Yeah. Also this keyboard player, uh, Brittany Davis. So. But we we will have some cool releases. But I just wanted people to you know check it out. So go to you got to look up Loose Groove uh, on Instagram, and uh, then they can find out anything they want. Oh, it's fantastic! The yeah. Painted Shield record, and I think you guys are working on a new one, right? Yeah, we're almost done. We're about to release. I think we're gonna have a single out for Fourth of July. So oh. look for that. You want to do a comedy record? <laughs> <laughs> I want to. <laughs> no, me. I will release my record. Oh yeah! yeah. Oh hell yeah! Yeah. yeah no, we'll do. Yeah, we'll we'll do a comedy record. Absolutely. That'd be incredible. Yeah. Oh my absolutely. God. All right. All Wait right. A second. I'm gonna hold you to that, man. It'll be great. Yeah. <laughs> now of course it'll, it'll be a live record, right? That's how comedy records are always yeah, live. Yeah, yeah. Nobody yeah. has studio comedy records. Yeah, that, great. That'd be hilarious, right? Go in yeah. the studio <laughs> and just do the bits <laughs> and put it out. I think that would be crazy. It's like okay, hey, here's the bits. You know, back in the day, there was a couple of comedy records I put on and the guys just did them in the studio. And you're yeah. like, this is weird. <laughs> yeah, I'll record it live somewhere and then I'll uh, send it over to you and we'll press it Great. and put it out. Great. We'll yeah. do some vinyl. Yeah. Oh, God, it'd be great. It's going to be huge. That's kind yeah, of like a, I love it. That'd be a dream come true on the same yeah. label as Brad. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Dean, we're in 100%. So, okay. all right. I love you. Um, all right. Pearl Jam, any plans to play live or anything? Uh, yeah, we got we got this shows coming up. Uh, Ohana Festival, Eve, uh, Ed's Festival down in San Diego. That's, oh, I'm, uh, I'm, when that's is that? I'm September. going to that. Oh, I'm going to go to that. Yeah, so that that that's the one to go see. And I think we're going to do the See Here Now Festival. I think that's been announced, but maybe not. And by the time this this airs, it'll be announced. So See Here Now is a, um, a Jersey Shore Festival. Cool. Um, outdoor so we're gonna play a couple of outdoor things and kind of see where it's at you know my favorite thing you guys do is man once in a while you'll open up with release and it's so genius it's like here you go yeah real quiet God, i, I love, love being quiet to start out with we're gonna get loud it's gonna get yeah. loud yeah you know like they say yeah it's i like to start out soft that's wonderful uh, right, it's man. been really nice getting to know you and uh, i look forward to chatting with you soon I'll, I'll i'll hit mike mccready up and let him know you're thinking about him Oh, God, I can't wait. Thank you so much, man. All right, Dean. Well, you are the best. Talk to you soon. Thank you.